Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Philip Securities Research Morning Call. For today, we have a few stock counter updates. So we have results for Airbnb, PayPal, DBS, Silver Lake Axis, Prime US REIT, BRC Asia, as well as Netlink. We also have a few updates from Capital Corp, as well as Singtel, and also video on the ground from IFAS, as well as Paragon REIT. We do also have technical analysis and also macro sector outlook for Fang and Monthly for the month of January, uh, Singapore strategy on the budget last week, as well as uh, and Singapore weekly for, for this week. So without further ado, let me hand over the time to Ambrish to talk about Airbnb results. Thank you, Zane, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, last week, we released Airbnb's fourth quarter earnings results report. Next slide, please. Overall, uh, the full year uh, 2022 revenue and patenting came in ahead of our expectations uh, with revenue at 101% and patenting at 110% of our full year forecasts. Uh, so uh, basically, in the, basically, in the fourth quarter, uh, Airbnb's total revenue, it grew by 24% year on year to 1.9 billion US dollars. And this was despite a 7% foreign exchange headwind. Meanwhile, uh, its patni uh, jumped by 480% year on year, and this was mainly because of the surge in its uh, bookings volumes as well as high operating leverage. Uh, moving on to its positives, uh, travel demand continued to remain strong in the fourth quarter. Its uh, number of uh, nights and experiences booked, it uh, rose by about 20% to 88.2 million. Uh, and this was mainly because uh, of a jump in uh, cross-border travel as the uh, COVID-19 restrictions they eased. And also as uh, the guests, they returned back to cities. Secondly, uh, uh, the long-term stays remained resilient with uh, stays of uh, 28 or more days and accounting for 21% uh, of gross bookings volume. And it was stable year over year. Meanwhile, uh, uh, stays of uh, at least seven nights, they accounted for 46% of its gross bookings volumes. And uh, the, this surge, it's mainly because uh, of the flexibility uh, due to the, the remote work environment. And lastly, uh, the listings on it, Airbnb's platform, uh, it has been accelerated. Uh, in FY22, uh, uh, the management highlighted that uh, its uh, active listings, they grew by about 16% year over year to 6.6 .6 million. And uh, this was, uh, we believe, mainly because of the company's efforts uh, into product improvements, uh, like uh, Airbnb setup and ask a super host, uh, basically providing help uh, to uh, hosts to uh, support or onboard them. And also because uh, uh, hosts, they are looking for some uh, extra income by listing their property. So moving on to the negative, uh, the average daily rates have been declining. Uh, it declined by about 1% in the fourth quarter to 153 US dollars. Uh, however, it was majority mainly because of its uh, foreign exchange headwinds. Uh, so uh, move, for its outlook, uh, management uh, expects uh, pressure on average daily rates in financial year 2023. The company highlighted that it's mainly because of uh, its business mix shift towards the states that have a lower average daily rates, uh, such as uh, the Asia Pacific region and the urban uh, regions. So moving on to its outlook. Uh, for the first quarter, the company said that it has been witnessing strong demand trends and as a result, it's, it expects revenue in the range of 1.75 billion to 1.82 billion. Uh, it, this suggests a growth rate of 16 to 21%. And also its uh, bookings volume is expected to grow by 20% to an uh, uh, implied calculation of 122.5 million bookings volumes. So uh, moving on to its uh, financial year 2023 outlook, the company uh, did not say much due to un macro uncertainty. However, uh, it expects uh, its adjusted earnings per share to remain uh, stable year over year to, uh, to compare, compared to uh, FI22 of about 35%. In terms of its valuations, we uh, downgraded the stock to accumulate from buy. And this was mainly because its stock price, it has recently uh, jumped. However, uh, our DCF target price, we increased it from $128 to $149. Uh, 
and this was mainly because we increased our full year revenue by 1% and patni by 15% uh, mainly because of lower expenses so uh, overall uh, despite uh, the the pullback in uh, discretionary spending we believe airbnb is well positioned uh, due to uh, 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 rising demand for alternative accommodations so uh, that's all for airbnb moving on to paypal next slide please uh, we released its a four quarter report last week with the title accelerated cost uh, reductions next slide overall uh, the results they were uh, in line with our forecasts with the revenue and patni coming in at about 100% so in the fourth quarter uh, paypal's total revenue it grew by about uh, 7% to 7.4 billion and this was mainly because of higher total payment volume so it basically paypal it basically it's a fintech company and it basically earns fees uh, of the payment volume that have been transacted over its platform so it's um, in terms of its patme it grew by about 15% and this was mainly because of cost control initiatives meanwhile uh, its adjusted earnings per share it reported uh, $1.24 uh, this was ahead of its uh, company's guidance range and it basically excludes a stock based compensation expense and amortization of intangibles so moving on to the positives <coughs> sorry uh, so uh, well, first of all uh, the company uh, report said that uh, customer engagement on its platform it continued to climb so the number of payment transactions uh, per active user it grew by about 13% and this is mainly because uh, the company it's now focusing on uh, its uh, uh, the existing users and it's not looking forward to uh, spend on advertising to attract new users uh, also uh, in the fourth quarter it uh, added 2.9 million net new active accounts uh, bringing its total user base to 435 million and secondly uh, the paypal it's it's focused on improving its operating margin so in the fourth quarter its uh, operating expenses they fell by about 5% and this was mainly because of cost cutting efforts like uh, job reduction and uh, real estate consolidation uh, the company it also highlighted that in the second half of 2022 it uh, cut costs by about 900 million and it has also highlighted uh, cost synergies of almost 2 billion uh, uh, in fy23 uh, this includes its recently announced layoffs of 2000 employees so moving on to the negative uh, there was a slowdown in total payment volume growth uh, year over year so in the fourth quarter of 2022 payment payment volume they grew by about 5% however uh, if we compare that to the fy fourth quarter of 21 uh, it was about 23% and the significant slowdown it's mainly because of uh, uh, global e-commerce trends weak uh, trends and also because consumers they have pulled down their discretionary spending due to inflationary pressures so moving on to the outlook uh, for the first quarter paypal it expects it expects to report a revenue growth of about 7.5 percent to uh, 7 billion and it expects its uh, adjusted earnings per share to be between $1.08 and $1.10. Sorry. Uh, so for FY23, uh, the company uh, it said that it expects uh, revenue to be uh, to grow by about mid uh, single digits uh, and a foreign exchange headwind of 1%. And the, the slowdown it's mainly because as of the weak uh, e-commerce trends and uh, macro concerns like consumers pulling back on their spending uh, despite the slowdown paypal it it is confident to uh, expand its operating margin by 125 basis point year over year and to grow its uh, earnings per share by 18 per 18 percent year over year and this is mainly because of its cost cutting initiatives uh, also uh, it expects uh, its uh, active users to remain flat in FY23, and because of its uh, uh, shift uh, towards the, driving the existing user engagement, in terms of its valuation, uh, we have lowered FY23 revenue by two percent uh, due to uh, consumer pullback. And uh, however, we increased our patme by four percent due to incremental cost reductions. 
Uh, so overall, uh, our uh, target price, it was reduced to $103 from previous $110 uh, with a weighted average cost of capital of uh, 7% and terminal growth rate of 4%. So uh, that's all for PayPal. Uh, I would now like to pass on to Jonathan for Fangam Monthly. Uh, thanks, Ambrish, and good morning. So I'll just start with uh, Fangam Monthly. Uh, we issued a report with the title, Strong Start to the Year. Thanks, sorry. Uh, in terms of performance, the Fang M was up 11.3% in January, uh, while the NASDAQ was up 10.6% and the S&P 500 uh, up 6.2%. Uh, the three main gainers were Meta, Amazon, and Netflix. So all three were up more than 20%. Um, I think Meta and Amazon were boosted by higher holiday sales, uh, as well as cooling goods inflation. Uh, while Netflix's fourth quarter uh, net additions uh, actually surprised to the upside of 3.2 million. So, so they added um, a, a lot more subscribers than they were expecting. Um, in terms of, of uh, Fang M price to sales ratio, uh, currently we're actually looking at this, uh, the price to sales ratio trending downwards. Um, and, and it's kind of following this, this path of uh, slowing revenue growth. Uh, we'll see this in the next slide. Uh, yeah, so, so right here, the chart on the left is just the monthly uh, Fang M price to sales ratio. Right now you can see it's hovering around six times. Uh, price to sales, uh, which is you know, basically its 10 year average. Uh, the chart on the right is the uh, last 12 months price to sales ratio versus the last, last 12 months uh, revenue growth. Uh, you can kind of see a, a, a downward trend that's happening, uh, led by the red line, which is revenue growth. Uh, so, revenue growth as of the first, uh, as of uh, December last year, uh, was hovering around 5 to 7%. Uh, down from like 30 plus percent uh, in, in uh, mid of 2021. Um, and, and so you can kind of see that the price of sale is also following this trend uh, downwards. Um, and we do think that, that, uh, that there is a lack of catalyst for Fang Yang growth, at least in the near term. Uh, so we, we do expect to see some uh, uh, downward pressures on price, uh, especially if revenue growth is, expect is going to be trending you know, somewhere in this uh, 5 to 10 percent range. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, just some company updates for Meta, Alphabet, and Netflix, uh, there wasn't much uh, to comment on for, for Meta. Uh, in terms of Netflix, uh, streaming continues to lead uh, in terms of US uh, TV time. Uh, so streaming right now is at 38.1%. It was slightly down uh, month on month. It, it's first decrease in 10 months. Um, uh, but the, the broadcast TV and cable TV were also down. Uh, the only real gainer was uh, video gaming, which was up 2% month on month, uh, predominantly because you know it's like the school holiday season. Uh, most of people, uh, I guess the, the more people are just playing video games in general. Uh, Netflix continues to, to remain in second place in, in, in streaming uh, at 7.5%, uh, trading only YouTube at 8.7%. Uh, for Alphabet, they announced that they would be cutting about 12,000 jobs uh, globally, which represents about 6% of its total workforce. Uh, these cuts will be broad based, um, so not not really focused on one single area, but uh, ranging from recruiting to engineering. Uh, the company also does expect about a two billion US dollar uh, severance related charge uh, in the first quarter of twenty twenty three. Overall, for these three companies, earnings were well, revenue and earnings were roughly in line with our expectations. Uh, revenue growth was was quite varied, from a four percent contraction for Meta to uh, a two percent uh, gain uh, for Alphabet. So really, there wasn't much uh, earnings growth uh, to be had in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, that being said, the key theme for, for all three companies were, were job cuts uh, and slowing expense growth. And, and, and I guess it, uh, that is probably going to be the focus for uh, this year moving forward, especially as, as revenue growth is expected to uh, remain fairly low in, in the single to, to mid uh, uh, Sorry, in, in the mid to high single digits for this year. Uh, so that's all for, for these three companies. I'll hand it over to Max for the rest. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan, and good morning, everyone. So firstly, for Apple, uh, the company has announced that it is planning to have more in-house developed components in its devices. So it has announced its plans to replace the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chips that are made by Broadcom, with the ones that are designed fully in-house. Uh, and this is expected to take place in 2025. It also announced that it is planned to swap out Qualcomm cellular modem chips that are present in iPhones 
and this could take place as early uh, as early as the end of 2024 or early 2025 as well. And more recently, uh, Apple has also announced that it is using it is planning to use a custom display that is developed fully in house as well instead of using those from third parties like Samsung or LG. Uh, the second news is that during the month of January, Apple has also launched the new MacBook Pro that comes with M2 chips. So the new MacBook Pro uh, will have a choice of either the M2 Pro or M2 Max, which is the successors of the M1 chip, the, the, process, the CPU that was developed by Apple that replaced Intel's. So uh, the new chip is said to be more power efficient, which results in a longer battery life for the new devices. So Apple also announced their uh, uh, first quarter 2023 results a couple of weeks ago, and the results were largely enough with uh, were, were a slight miss from our expectations. Uh, revenue was down by 5.5% uh, year on year, and this was mainly because of a drag uh, by the iPhone sales that declined by 8% and the slump of 29% in max sales because of time comparison. Uh, however, these declines were partially offset by the 30% year on year growth in iPad sales, and services also continued the growth trajectory at 6% year on year. Uh, so, um, uh, Apple during the quarter, Apple also managed to expand the gross margin quarter on quarter despite facing a stronger FX set win compared to the previous quarter. So in terms of outlook, uh, Apple, Apple has gathered that the second quarter year-on-year -year revenue performance is going to be similar to the first quarter, which is, a, which, is, which is a decline of 5%. And this is because hardware sales, especially Mac and iPads, are expected to decline by double digits because of tough comparison as well as the micro headwinds. So um, however, iPhone sales is expected to re-accelerate and uh, services will continue to grow to will continue its growth trajectory moving forward. So yeah, uh, moving on to Amazon. So I guess the like the major news for Amazon is that it announced a layoff of eighty thousand workers, and this mainly affected those in the corporate ranks. So the eighteen thousand number is 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 uh, makes up about five percent of the company's corporate workers, or roughly around one point two percent of Amazon's overall workforce of one point five million employees. And management has said that this run of layoffs uh, mainly affected the employees in the retail and recruiting divisions of the company. Secondly, and during the month of January, Amazon also announced a new health offering for its Prime members. So this new offering is a service where sub, uh, Prime members can subscribe into on top of the existing Prime memberships. And this would allow them to have unlimited access to community prescribed medications that treats more than 80 medical conditions in the US. Uh, the new health, the new service is a price at five US dollars per month, and this is part of Amazon's push to uh, and to try in, in the efforts to enter the healthcare industry. Uh, however, Amazon indicated that this new service is unavailable for customers with Medicare or Medicaid in the US. So Amazon also announced their fourth quarter twenty twenty two earnings uh, at a similar timing as Apple, and the results were largely in line with our expectations. Uh, revenues actually grew. Uh, revenue actually beat the top end of company guidance. And this was because uh, retail sales were boosted by the prime early access sales in October, as well as the Thanksgiving Cyber Monday weekend sales that up for expectations. Um, interestingly, uh, advertising revenue for Amazon actually grew 19% year on year, and this bucked the industry trends where we see companies like Meta and Alphabet C uh, were seeing a uh, decline in re uh, digital advertising revenue. AWS remained as the company's fastest growing segment, but uh, and the, it is it's expected to be decided in the second quarter, uh, in the first quarter of 2023, because customers continue to opt for low cost products. So overall, although we expect uh, we expect native revenue growth challenges, we think growth will reaccelerate in the in in FY24, especially for AWS as Amazon increases its client base and uh, customers are expected to scale up their computing demand when the macro improves. So that's all for me. I'll hand over my time back to Ambrish to talk about Microsoft. Thank you, Max. Uh, so for Microsoft, there were two main news. Uh, first of all, uh, it announced its uh, largest uh, layoff in the uh, last decade, uh, which impacted 10,000 employees, 5% uh, of its workforce. So, uh, these job reductions, uh, they are expected to be completed by uh, March 2023. Uh, and uh, the company it uh, took a 1.2 billion uh, charge uh, in second quarter of 2023 
Secondly, uh, Microsoft it announced a ten billion worth of investment in OpenAI. So OpenAI it basically is the owner of ChatGPT. Uh, so it ChatGPT uh, it was launched in November last year and has uh, grown into uh, millions of users mainly because uh, it can uh, write emails or uh, develop codes in a few seconds. And uh, uh, so basically, with uh, this uh, uh, investment. It plans to compete with uh, Alphabet uh, in commercializing the new artificial intelligence breakthroughs. Uh, and lastly, Microsoft, it also announced its uh, second quarter results in January. So uh, they were within our expectations at 48% revenue and 46% patent of our overall forecasts for FY23. So uh, cloud, it, it's the main growth driver for uh, Microsoft. And Azure, it reported a 38% year-on-year growth. However, uh, that growth uh, it is expected to slow down in the third quarter, uh, mainly because uh, the large companies uh, they are uh, uh, they pause they are pausing their uh, spending because of the macroeconomic environment, and uh, also uh, uh, Microsoft uh, it uh, in the middle in the near term it's expected to be impacted by foreign exchange headwinds as it generates uh, uh, most of its revenues from international markets. And also uh, in the mid middle term, it's expected that uh, there is there could be some weakness in its PC uh, segment, uh, mainly because its uh, Windows OEM revenue it's expected to drop by thirty percent year on year in the third quarter of 2023. Uh, this is mainly because uh, there are a weak demand for PC sales, and uh, as uh, the manufacturers like uh, uh, Dell and uh, uh, HP or uh, uh, whatever uh, Asia, they uh, they have uh, low uh, low uh, supply. They are selling low uh, uh, laptops, and as a result, uh, uh, Microsoft it's uh, 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 Microsoft in, is installed on their laptops uh, at a lower pace. So overall, uh, we maintain a buy recommendation with a target price of two ninety eight. Mainly because uh, the companies uh, they are prioritizing uh, digital transformation to remain competitive. So uh, to conclude, uh, next slide please. Uh, we we remain neutral on Fangam uh, mainly because uh, in the near term there is a slowdown in digital advertising and uh, pullback in cloud spending and weak uh, consumer tech demand. And also uh, for the Fangam revenue growth, uh, we expect them to be in the mid to high uh, uh, digit range, which is as much as uh, five, uh, half of its uh, five-year Kega, which was 15%. So uh, that's all for Fangam. Uh, I would now like to pass on to Glenn for DBS. Thanks, Ambrish. So uh, for DBS, the next slide, please. The, yeah, the fourth quarter 22 earnings of 2.34 billion were above our estimates, mainly due to higher net interest income, uh, slightly offset by lower fee income. The FY22 PME is at 104% of our forecast. The fourth quarter 22 DPS was up 17% year on year to 42 cents with an additional special dividend of 50 cents. So the full year dividend rose 67% year on year to a total of 200 cents. So for the positives, the first positive was that the net interest income spiked 53% year on year due to a net interest margin surge of 62 basis points year on year to 2.05%. And this is despite flat loans growth of 1% year on year. So increases in non-trade corporate housing and trade loans were offset by lower loans in other segments as some corporates shifted their borrowing to cheaper financing options or repaid opportunistic borrowing. Management has guided for a peak, peak NIM of 2.25% for FY23 with a downside risk of 5 to 7 basis points, mainly due to the outflows to T-bills, the strengthening of the SING dollar, as well as higher funding costs. For the second positive was that other non-interest income surged 119% year on year, mainly due to an increase in treasury customer sales to both corporate and wealth management customers, as well as higher trading gains, which more than offset a decline in gains from investment securities. The last positive was that the fourth quarter total allowances were lower both year on year and quarter on quarter due to a higher GP write back of 116 million for the quarter. Uh, this uh, uh, meant that full year allowances were at 237 million. 
Uh, for the credit costs, the fourth quarter credit costs were flat year on year at six basis points, while full year credit costs improved four basis points year on year to eight basis points. The GP reserves dipped slightly to 3.7 billion, with NPA reserves at 122% and unsecured NPA reserves at 215%. Nonetheless, the NPL ratio declined to 1.1% as the new NPA formation remained low and was more than offset by higher upgrades and repayments. For the negatives, the first negative was that the fee income decline continued and it was mainly due to weaker market sentiment affecting the wealth management <clears throat> and investment banking, which more than offset increases in card and loan rated fees. The wealth management fees fell 31% year on year as weaker financial market conditions led to lower investment product sales, while the investment banking fees fell by 64% year on year, alongside a slowdown in capital market activities. Nonetheless, this was offset by uh, credit card fees improving 22% year on year as travel spending continued to recover towards pre pandemic levels, while the loan related fees were stable. The second negative was that the current account savings accounts or CASA ratio fell 21% year on year to 60.3%. And this was mainly due to the high interest rate environment as well as a continued move towards fixed deposits. Nonetheless, total customer deposits increased 5% year on year to 527 billion. As for the outlook, the DBS's business momentum remained strong, and despite economic uncertainties from macroeconomic factors, such as lower growth, higher inflation, as well as supply chain disruptions, their loan and transaction pipelines are expected to be strong. The GP reserves are also sufficient, and it is with its capital position as well as liquidity well above the regulatory requirements and high allowance reserves, we believe that DBS has sufficient provisions to ride out the current economic uncertainties. The CT1 ratio rose 0.8% or term quarter to 14.6% and is currently at the upper end of DBS's target operating range. Uh, they also expect fee income recovery and with China's recent reopening, management expects it to benefit the regional operating environment and has seen an uptick in momentum and business volumes entering the first quarter of 2023. So DBS has guided for a double-digit fee income growth for FY23, and this could add around $370 million to revenue. Lastly, DBS has also mentioned that they have a $1.3 billion Sing dollar exposure to the Adani Group, with the majority of exposure in a $1 billion loan to Adani, for Adani's acquisition of, a, of Swiss construction materials company Olsims Cement Business in India, and this was completed in September 2022 with the remaining exposure of 300 million spread out to the rest of the group. Nonetheless, this exposure is backed by the cement company, which is debt-free with cash flows, and DBS is also managing the exposure tightly. So furthermore, this exposure only makes up 0.3% of its total loan book and around 2% of total equity. As such, we maintain our buy recommendation with an unchanged target price of $41.60, and we lower the FY23 earnings by 3% as we lower net uh, NII estimates for FY23 due to lower loans growth, offset slightly by higher fee and other non-interest income. Moving on to Silver Lake. Yep, uh, next slide. Yep, the second quarter um, earnings of 42.1 million ringgit were in line with our estimates despite a dip, and the first half earnings were at 48% of our FY23. The 29% year-on-year dip in earnings came from a drop in gross profit margin due to the change in revenue mix as lower projected project-related revenue was slightly offset by higher recurring revenue. For the positives, the first positive was that the recurring revenue, which comprises maintenance and enhancement services, insurance ecosystem transactions and services, and the retail transactions processing revenue, increased the maintenance and enhancement increased 5% year-on-year to 141 million ringgit, as the dip in enhancement services revenue was more than offset by the increase in maintenance revenue. For the ecosystem, uh, insurance ecosystem transactions and service revenue, it also increased 32% as volumes have rebounded to pre-COVID-19 levels, with sizable volume increases coming from new operations in Japan and the UAE. For the retail transactions processing revenue, it also surged 137% year-on-year, and this was mainly due to higher subscriptions for their cloud-based retail solution, which is Agora Cloud, from both retail and pharmaceutical customers in Malaysia and Singapore. The second positive was, is that their order backlog remains healthy, 
And Silver Lake's project pipeline is currently at 1.8 billion ringgit, with an order backlog of 275 million ringgit on the verge of closing in the third quarter. And Silver Lake is beginning to close more deals and is also witnessing an uptick in inquiries about its financial services market solutions as well as capabilities. For the negatives, their project-related revenue fell 22% year-on-year, uh, -year, and their project-related revenue consists of their software licensing and software project services. So for their software licensing revenue, it fell 51% year-on-year, mainly due to the progression of actual project delivery varying from quarter to quarter, and this resulted in a lag in revenue contribution. However, this was offset by an increase in their software project services revenue by 25% year on year, as there was additional revenue recognized from recently closed contracts from countries such as Thailand, UAE, and Malaysia. So for the outlook, their Mobius banking platform remains the differentiator and launched in 2020, this uh, Silverlix Mobius cloud banking software allows banks to roll out new digital products in a targeted and timely manner. It also allows banks to use their existing core banking software as well and propel them to new digital products. Silver Lake has recently signed a deal with one of the largest banks in Thailand <clears throat> and is continuing to see increasing inquiries in the region. So we expect Mobius to generate almost 100 million ringgit of orders over the next two years. Secondly, Silver Lake's recurring maintenance and enhancement revenue contributed to more than 69% of their second quarter revenue, and it grew at a KGA of 4% despite the COVID-19 pandemic. With the reopening of borders as well as economies in ASEAN, we can expect Silver Lake's customers to increase their IT spending to accelerate their digitalization plans to grow. As such, we maintain a buy rating on Silver Lake's with an unchanged target price of 49 cents. And we feel that, in our opinion, <clears throat> excuse me, Silver Lake should grow at a higher premium to its uh, historical PE with the introduction of Mobius as well as the resumption of bank IT spending after the pandemic. Now, moving on to the next slide. Yeah, so for IFAST, they recently released their uh, fourth quarter results, and this is a Philip on the ground for IFAST. Uh, we don't cover IFAST. So for IFAST, their fourth quarter assets under administration or AUA fell 8.3% year on year, but rose 2.5% quarter on quarter. Um, there's a positive though, it was that their net inflows of client assets remain positive at 263 million in the fourth quarter and 2.13 billion uh, in total for the full year. However, this is a quite a big uh, drop from the previous years with the fourth quarters uh, 21s at 757 million and FY21 at 3.75 billion. So their revenue was also down 13%. Uh, the fourth quarter revenue was down 13% year on year with net profit down 86% year on year. However, the recurring net revenue showed some signs of uh, positivity at, and it was up 2.8% year on year. Uh, nonetheless, their final dividend uh, remains unchanged year on year at 1.4 cents. For their Hong Kong e-pension business targets, their guidance, which they released in April 2022, uh, is unchanged and is maintained. And they have mentioned that it remains an important driver of growth from 2023 to 2025. For their IFAS Global Bank, uh, they have mentioned that their core business is easy remit and they have started their phase one of the digital personal banking, or otherwise known as the IFAS ecosystem. Uh, they will be starting it soon in within a couple of months. And for the IFAS Global Bank, they are also still incurring initial startup losses and they start they target to achieve profitability starting in 2024. So that's all I have, and I'll hand it over to Darren. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. So for Prime Year Street, we think that the strong rental reversals will help to drive growth for them. The next slide, please. Yeah, so for Prime Year Streets, their FY22 results, it was slightly under our estimates as the gross revenue was impacted by lower occupancy and the absence of the termination income that was received in the second half of 21. The second half for the full year 22, the finance expenses were also higher, which, is, which resulted in a lower DPU. So for the positives, they continued their strong rental reversion trend of 20.2% for fourth quarter 22, and it's the 11th consecutive quarter for positive rental reversions. And their occupancy right now is at 89.1%. It dipped slightly from 89.6% in the previous quarter. 
However, leasing remains active with activity coming from finance, biotech, manufacturing, and legal services. So on the capital management front, 82% of their debt is on fixed rate or hedged, and they have no refinancing until July 2024. Their gearing increased from 38.7% to 42.1% because of the decline in portfolio valuation, but it's still within the 45% limits of the, the MS regulatory limits. And the ICR is also well above the 2.5% to bring their gearing up to 5%. Uh, sorry, to bring that gearing up to 50%. The effective interest rate is uh, at 3.4% and it crept up from 3.1% in the previous quarter. So for the negatives, their portfolio value declined, which is basically uh, in line with a uh, menu life, uh, also declined uh, down 6.7% due to higher discount and cap rate assumptions used by valuers. So all their portfolios uh, saw valuation declines and cap rate increase on average across the board by 50 basis points. Reston Square, one of their properties saw the biggest uh, decline of 14.2% uh, because of the non-renewal of a tenant last uh, last year, or rather in FY2022. So uh, these three assets, Village Center, One Town Center, uh, these three assets are the only ones that came in at double digits. So the rest came in at around uh, single digits and around 3 to 4% percent percentage declines. So for the outlook, uh, one of the top 10 tenants, uh, that there's media reports that they are leaving the, the ad property as of December 23 when their lease expires. But a good thing, I guess, is that uh, this Prime still has one year to renegotiate or look for other tenants to help to fill up the space. Right now, physical occupancy across the board in the US is uh, surpassed 50% for the first time. And Prime's physical occupancy is ranges from 30% to 85%, depending on the submarkets. So it's quite uneven for uh, across all the, all the markets in the US. But we expect this to improve further as many uh, major companies they, uh, start expecting their employees to return to office full-time or part-time. And new hires, hiring also is pivoting away from the remote positions. Right now, in place rents are 6.3% uh, below the asking rents. So Prime continues to see occup uh, opportunity for more positive rental reversions going forward. So with that, we maintain our buy call on Prime US REIT, uh, we, but we lower our target price from 88 cents to 70 cents. We also, we lower our DPU forecast for FI23 to FI25 by 12 to 15% due to lower occupancy and higher financing costs. Prime remains our topic in the US office sector and catalysts in, uh, include greater leasing and uh, uh, higher greater return to office. So right now, Prime is trading at 0.6 times price to NAV, but we think that a lot of the negatives are already priced in. So previously, Prime's NAV was at 85 cents, but then uh, after this asset devaluation, at the end of the year, it's 75 cents. So right now, it's a 0.6 times price to NAV, but we believe it's already priced in. That's why we still have a buy call on Prime US Street. The current share price uh, implies a forward dividend yield of 13.6% or 14.7% for FI23 and FI24. Yeah, next slide, please. So for Paragon, we, we hosted them uh, a guest presentation webinar last week. So for those of you who do not know, uh, Paragon Read is the new name for SPH Read. And uh, they, changed, they changed name at the start of the year. And uh, they also changed their reporting period. So previously, uh, it is not calendar. It doesn't follow the calendar year, but now they change it to the calendar year. So that's why they reported the sixteen month to to align it with the calendar year going forward. So Paragon Reed is a two point seven five billion retail REIT with assets in Singapore and Australia. The the biggest asset, with biggest contribution across is Paragon. So for the sixteen month twenty two, its MPI was up three point three percent to two hundred eighty million. Portfolio occupancy is also very high at 98.5%. 98, 98 so on the capital management front, 84% of their loans are on fixed rates and their gearing is low at 30%. Their adjusted ICR is at 4.7% and EIR, which is the effective interest rate, is at 3.09%. Their weighted average term maturity is at 2.8 years and they only have 7% of the total debt due in FI23. So uh, for valuations, the valuations are rather flat or rather they increase slightly with no change in cap rates. So, so that's a good thing and it's uh, 
we, we see the same thing for all the other uh, retail REITs in Singapore. Uh, for rental reversions, um, uh, it was down 4.1% for the 16 month 22 versus 8.4% for the FY21. So the, the negative rental reversions are becoming lesser and uh, going forward, we believe, uh, they believe that it could uh, improve to maybe a flat because uh, it, it's still negative mainly because they usually, there's, there's a delay when they sign, uh, re renew their leases like six six months to one year in advance because they don't want to renew so late. Like if you renew so late, then there might be a vacant uh, vacancy period or downtime. So they don't want that downtime. That's why they started renewing their lease so, so early in advance. And when you renew your lease like six months or one year in advance, it's, it's based on the sentiment at that point in time on like the, the rental rates and, and et cetera. So if the, the point in time when it's not so, so uh, the sentiment is not so strong, so the, the rental rates you get are, are not as high as perhaps now if you renew because the sentiment is much better with the strong tenant sales and such. So on the bottom uh, right hand side of the graph, you see the tenant sales of Paragon. The FY22, the tenant sales increased 45% year on year and it's 1% higher than 2019, which is pre-COVID levels already. As you can see, the, the blue line is already up. The, the December 22, the blue line spiked up. That's the tenant sales above pre-COVID levels. And right now, the, the footfall is also almost hitting pre-COVID levels, but on average, the 20, FY22 footfall was at 80% uh, of pre-COVID levels. So for the outlook, yeah, the management has, expects the rental reversion to improve with strong tenant sales and positive sentiment. And for Paragon Reed, they have a right of first, first refusal for Salita and Woodley Mall from their sponsor. And right now, Paragon Reed is trading at 5.4% dividend yield. Yeah, so that's all for me. I'll now hand over the time to Terence. Yeah, thanks, Darren, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, for Capo Corporation, they receive a the Samcom Marine shareholders actually cleared the way for the divestment in our next slide. The so Samcom Marine shareholders have cleared the way for the proposed combination of uh, Capo O and M, voting overwhelmingly in favor of the acquisition with ninety five point two eight percent. So in terms of positive, the there are two key positives for us lah for this. Firstly, it's, uh, finally they finally get to to clear. Uh, divest of the O and M business. Uh, for us, this represents an important uh, milestone towards having an asset like business model. The the focus for them now can also shift towards transforming its urban development business because previously when they have this O and M uh divestment, they 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 cannot go full steam on the the transformation of the urban development business. But with this this divestment now, we believe they will actually shift their their focus towards the urban development business. So the plan is to move to shift the business towards a real estate as a service solutions model in line with the, the whole the, the business strategy of being asset light and one also focus on recurring income. So for those who have been following Keppel for a long time, you all will know that Keppel has traditionally been an order book business and, and not one uh, that has a, a very strong recurring income base. But when we look at their recent financial year 22 earnings, the recurring income is already 67% or two thirds of their overall earnings. Uh, as compared to when we when we look at FY19, uh, FY18 and 19, it was just about under 50%. Uh, so you can see a very, very, very huge transformation uh, take place. In our next slide, in terms of the timeline, the uh, our uh, for the capital shareholders holding uh, the shares, uh, your the the last date of the come distribution trading. Uh, is on the 22nd of February. Anybody holding capital shares uh, as at the closing of 22nd February will be entitled uh, to the, the Samcom Marine share distribution, which is 19.1 uh, Samcom Marine shares for every one capital share that you hold. So the, the expected date of the completion of the proposed combination is expected on the 28th of February and capital shareholders will receive the shares on the 1st of March 2023. Uh, it, on this uh, table here on your left hand side, you can see how um, the, the, the capital's pro forma NTA per share. So how, what, what we have an illustration here is when you look at the financial year the 2022, the pro forma NTA per share is $5.51. Uh, post O&M transaction, the 
NTA per share is actually seven dollars and fifty six cents. So how we have got this seven dollars and fifty six cents is we included the disposal gains uh, that they will they will receive. So it's about one dollar and ninety cents uh, of disposal gains that they will have from uh, the transaction inside the the NTA, and then post distribution of Semcom Marine shares, the and NTA is about 5.23. So you can see the decline is actually very, very little, even though they, they are doing this distribution, uh, which is about $2 distribution of Sam Marine shares. But you can see the, the post distribution of Sam Call Marine shares, it barely budged, is it's still, still about $5.23. So in terms of our target price in our next slide and recommendation, uh, we maintain a buy with an unchanged sum of the parts target price of nine dollars and fifty four cents. Uh, this nine dollars and fifty four cents is based on some of the parts. Uh, but we have a twenty percent whole co discount. Uh, as one one thing that we would note is that as capital moves towards transforming its business to being increasingly asset light, uh, we expect the discount to narrow because as you've got lesser units now already. So that's all for me for capital in our next slide on BRC Asia. The the key thing for BRC Asia is that. The outlook and the current uh, climate remains challenging for them. In their first quarter of 2023, earnings declined 12.2%, uh, which was 11% uh, of our full year uh, 22, 23 estimates. Rather, uh, this, 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 despite the earnings were below, uh, despite accounting for uh, seasonally weaker first half 23. Usually, the for BRC Asia, first half is weaker for them, second half is stronger. Uh, but this was already this was uh, already further weighed down by the heightened safety period. So if you look at the um, table here on your left hand side, you can see one of the, the main drags was their gross profit margin, which is which is the the result of of um, more intense competition, labor and energy costs. Uh, so so earnings that's why earnings come under lah. But and in terms of outlook, the heightened safety period has been extended by another three months. So with this extension. We expect to see the group uh, report a slower nine months 23 because of this extension. The local construction demand, that's it. However, the local construction demand is expected to remain robust with the BCA projecting total construction demand for 2023 to be 27 to $32 billion. One thing we would note uh, is that despite this, this extension in the heightened safety period, the total construction demand actually is unchanged from 2022. So this tells you that even though the, the authorities are concerned about the, the heightened safety period extension, but the, the order backlog is still very, very strong. So Sorry, I, 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 think, I think I dropped out early on. So I, I, I don't know why I missed out. So I'll probably just uh, touch on the last few, few points. Yeah, so we, we, we maintain our buy recommendation on BRC Asia, uh, but with a lower target price of $2.14. But we still like, BRC, that's why the challenging climate, we still like BRC Asia because um, it is a, we, we see them as a market leader and still a, a, a proxy to the cons overall construction recovery in the sector. So that's all from me for BRC Asia. I'll now hand over the time to Zin. Uh, thanks, Terence. Good morning, everyone. So now I'll be covering the technical analysis section. So for the Straits Times Index, uh, last week we actually dipped below the 3,350 level to actually retest this 3,300 uh, neckline breakout of the inverse head and shoulders. So for now, I think that we could actually trade in a range for now. Uh, the support is actually around 3,270 to about 3,300 area, while the resistance is at about 3,350 to about 3,400 area, which was 3,004, which was the, the high uh, year to date. Uh, moving on to the S&P 500, uh, currently it looks like we are experiencing a short-term pullback in this uh, bullish flag formation. So uh, we actually... Uh, broke through the 4,100 level, but we subsequently came down uh, it, uh, quite, quite fast. So for now, it uh, looks like we are still in a period of consolidation with the immediate resistance at about 4,001 to 4,200 area. Or the support is likely to be found at uh, 3,950 to about 4,060 area. So uh, support is likely to be found 
possibly with the uptrend support line uh, shown in the chart below uh, in that region. Uh, for individual counters, the first one I have is a digital core read. So for this, we have a technical buy at uh, 62 and a half cents. Uh, with profit levels at 66 and a half cents as well as 72 cents. The stop loss can be placed at uh, 59 cents. Uh, and the stop loss close at 60 cents on Friday. So for digital core read, uh, the price actually retested this downtrend resistance line that it broke out of, as well as the previous horizontal resistance level at 61 cents, which is now expected to turn into support uh, with the formation of a bullish hammer candle on 10th February uh, following the pullback. So we could see continuation of the short-term uptrend uh, and bullish momentum to actually retest the recent swing high at 66 and a half cents and then followed by uh, 72, and a, 72 cents resistance level, uh, which was the which was a previous support uh, back in September of last year that is now turned into resistance. So in my next counter will be a uh, sales force. So for this, we have a technical buy at $171.08. Uh, the profit level can be set at $178.80 and $189.20 with the stop loss at $165. So the stop loss goes at $165.17 on Friday. So for Salesforce, the price is actually found some support at $165 level, which we was previously uh, quite a strong uh, resistance that is now taking the support with the formation of uh, this bullish engulfing candle on 13th Feb uh, following a back test. And also, we could see a potential continuation of this bullish momentum to, with the price actually trading in the uptrend channel currently after breaking out of the downtrend, uh, to retest the to first retest the recent swing high at one hundred seventy eight dollars and eighty cents, and subsequently we could uh go further to test the one hundred eighty nine dollars and twenty cents level, which is a strong resistance back in June to August of last year. Uh, also for Salesforce, our research team has a fundamental recommendation of buy for this counter with a target price of $205, uh, just to take note. So that's all from me for the technical analysis section. I'll now pass on my time to Paul to talk about the Singapore budget based uh, last Tuesday. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, thanks. So I'll just run through some of the key highlights for the budget that was announced on Valentine's Day. Uh, okay, next slide. So, there's a lot, of, a lot, a lot of items here, but let me just share some of the key points for us. Um, the positive is, of course, whenever there's a fiscal deficit spending by the government, it, it means that you no, know, it's it's going to be beneficial to the it's, to the economy. Although it's a bit more modest from two billion deficit to now 0.4, uh, but but uh, because a lot of it is handout, so it's going to benefit the economy. Um, I think we all know there'll be more support. The second bullet point, more support for our households. Uh, so, so in in conclusion, for at least the macro part, uh, is a positive fiscal boost. Uh, the one uncertainty is that in a typical five year period, the government needs to balance the budget. So based on whatever data we could get, the last three years has been a deficit of seven billion. So it's just not sure. Most likely they can, but I mean it's just not totally clear uh, whether the next two budgets coming up. They need they need a bigger surplus to kind of cover back this seven billion or, or less. I mean, most likely it's going to be less. Uh, so some of the benefits would be, of course, uh, it's a sing song because you know, as usual, there'll be more handouts for households to cope, or more vouchers for all of us, of course. And of uh, comfort to a certain extent, because now competitors like Grab uh, need to will face higher employee costs. Uh, it is mandatory for those below 30. And also above it is optional, which of uh, so it depends on whether the rider wants to. It doesn't apply to taxi because they are they are uh, sorry they, they are for those who are street hailing. Uh, so the other so those are the three bullet points. Uh, the the other part, if you look on the left, the other beneficiary uh will probably be defense again. So defense is of course ST engineering. So if you look at the third pointer or the third arrow, uh, you can see that defense spending continues to be strong. Uh, the government cut back on health uh, and also boost. So one of the biggest areas of spending continues to be defense for, for the government total expenditure. So it's up 6%. So the other positive. Uh, the other positive is also for construction. Uh, so if you look at this table on the left, uh, the one total inflows means all types of revenue that the government generate. Uh, the first line is, of course, taxes. The second line net investment return, you know, uh, some of you may really know, know this is what is the return 
uh, that they get from Tomasin and GLC, uh, half the return and some assumptions behind it. The third one is a new thing. It's called capitalization of infrastructure. So uh, in 2021, what the government did was to, to issue this thing called Singa bonds, which is a significant infrastructure, whatever. It's called Singa, and just to make it easier. So basically, what it allows the government to do is to spend more on infrastructure. So it has a maximum value of 90 billion. Because without this, then the government cannot spend because every they have to balance the budget. So this allows them to spend more than the budget. Uh, but then, then you do the depreciation. So like for accounting terms, you know, uh, instead of expensing it off, the government will, will capitalize. So that's why you see this capitalization of, of 2.3 to, to 3.5. So these are some of those big info, uh, MRT projects. Rather than, 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 than impacting the budget, they capitalize it so that they will depreciate it later. So this is positive. Uh, that's why maybe the construction sector, the BCA is guiding very strong numbers for the next uh, five years because the government is spending out of the budget uh, almost could be up to 90 billion at the allowable limit. So that's why this is something new that you see. Uh, the fourth bullet point uh, is just for, for you to, just for information purpose. Uh, most of this spending, you see most of the jump in, in total expenditure by the government is in the top ups. Uh. So top ups is mainly uh, all these GST vouchers to all of us and uh, all the assurance package and whatever. And the big one is actually, if you look at the bottom, if you want to see, uh, if you want to know uh, the, the breakdown of the top ups, is this new thing called the National Productivity Fund. So a lot of the government money is into this new, new expenditure, 4 billion of it is huge. Uh, it's mainly to try to invite more investments. And it's, the new thing the government's going to do is like co invest in projects from this 4 billion. Uh, the last point. Again, totally out of interest only. Uh, everyone, because uh, uh, we always get like weapon to all the property sales. So, uh, for the from the government's uh, accounting point of view, these land sales are capital receipts. Uh, so they're not in the income that you see the total inflow. So you can think of it like no, they are like disposal gains for typical company. So that's why they don't put it as part of the budget. But of course, the government is expecting eighteen billion. Uh, so that's a lot. Uh. Yeah. So so how to read the table on the left is total inflow means all the money the government collects. Total outflow is all the money that goes out and then uh, this overall is the balance. Okay, uh, again, uh, I'm not sure anyone really cares, but any, if you want to understand how the budget works. Uh, next slide. Uh, so for, for Singtel's results, uh, the results was below expectations because there was basically currency headwinds, as the title suggests, uh, everywhere there was currency headwinds. Uh, next slide. So for the revenue met expectations, but EBITDA was weaker. So uh, the Australian dollar alone, there was an eight percentage point drag. So um, probably worse than the, than the fangs. But so uh, the positive is Bati of India, the the, the mobile operator in India, uh, continues to be the star performer. So if you look on the table on the left, uh, Bati, the last column, you can see the earnings jump hundred fifty one percent. Even though there was a seven percent currency hit win, so you can uh, the strength of it is because. Um, ARPU, which is selling price in India rose, and then they got more 4G subscribers, but tend to have higher ARPU too. And data is a bit a higher margin. Uh, the ne negative continues to be Australia. So Australia is still, going to, is still the weak spot for them. Uh, the good thing is that even after the cyber attack, which everybody was worried, now all the subscribers are run away, but it didn't. The subscribers were mobile subscribers were kind of flat. Uh, but in terms of the outlook, so for Singtel in general, uh, although we have accumulated uh, the earnings won't be that fantastic because the parts that's doing well for Singtel is uh, going to be Bati and Singapore Mobile is doing well. Uh, but the one that's dragging down overall is Optus and also uh, NCS, which is a new, which is, they're setting up this new part for enterprise business uh, to, to sub IT services. But because they're going to be uh, in some investment phase, they need to build up headcount, you know, build up a base in, I think Vietnam and India. So all this is going to take up a lot. Although the revenue you look on the table on the left is up 21%. Of course, some of it is, I think, is acquisition growth. So we maintain accumulate, but we're going to but we lowered our target price. So our, our target price also has some mark to market link to Bati share price. So if Bati share price keeps on going up, then we will our target price will also increase. But this time round is down because we cut our earnings for Australia. Uh, the problem, one last point is that the problem for Optus is that. Their ROE is, is pathetic. Uh, it's less than 1%. Uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So I think the problem with Optus is just that the hit count, even though the results also wasn't that great, they are still increasing their hit count. Uh, but I'm not sure why. Uh, but 
so this is the area they need to resolve. I mean, if they, if they want the share price, otherwise these opters continue to be to provide very paltry returns and, and returns on capital for them. Uh, next slide. So I'll go through uh, the next, last corporate one for me, a uh, netlink. Oh, next slide. Uh, so for netlink, the results uh, was more or less in, in line. Uh, the EBITDA was a bit higher because they have got more divergent uh, uh, income. But there was a pick up in diversion because I think when you do more construction activity, uh, you need to change the fibers and add more fiber. And so so the, all this will, will move the fiber. Uh, so all this will have some impact and they will get some revenue for that. Uh, to do all this uh, diversion uh, business. Uh, the negative is interest rate. So you can see finance charges, interest rates has started to climb almost 60%. So for a company that has very limited growth, uh, all this will bite into their cash flows. So for, for the up for our outlook, you know, uh, you know, the pressure point now is that the interest rates are high, although they hedge most of it uh, up to 2024. So we still maintain a neutral. I think for us, uh, they, we don't think they can grow their their dividends uh, uh, and also at the same time uh, the attractiveness the six percent yield is, is uh, we think is less attractive in this interest rate in this environment where interest rates were uh, climbing up to almost risk three rates almost four percent and then they got limited growth in dividends and also headwinds from rising interest expense so that's why we have a neutral on it uh, it used to be positive and interest rates of one percent they paid like five percent yield so you get like a four percent spread Right, you you paid four percent additional compared to what you're getting. I don't from FD rate or whatever. But now FD rate is about three plus percent. Now you're used three. So, yeah, uh, in that context, the attraction isn't uh, as as high as in the past. Uh, yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. So, so I'll, I'll move on to our weekly. Uh, the first point is residential new launch is still very poor, uh, extremely weak. Uh, but of course, it's a uh, Chinese New Year, so the new launch you need so is only three hundred ninety one, so like forty percent down. Uh, last month was seventy percent down, so I think they better launch more. <laughs> uh, tourism is still strong, uh, but we are still like sixty percent of pre-pandemic levels. So uh, obviously, they're going to be more upside with, with from tourism, uh, because you know with the China reopening. Uh, ready mix concrete, which is more the pan united part. Uh, the demand contracted, like what uh Terence also mentioned, because heightened a lot. But overall, I think construction uh, long, uh, medium term is still going to be very strong because the government is spending more than before. In a nutshell. Uh, the weakest part, the one that's worrying the most for macro is uh, exports. So Singapore exports was down twenty five percent. Electronics exports was down twenty seven. So the contraction is probably you are, this is like the pandemic recession type of contraction. So that's quite a worrying thing we, we face. Not that we shared last uh, last week, Taiwan is also facing similar contraction in exports and electronic exports. Uh, I won't run through everything. Uh, the only thing for the for, I think for CPI, we all know uh, it was the market expecting six point two came six point four. So that's why uh, the bond yields in the US rose because they think the inflation is harder to control. Uh, the retail sales was very strong, but we noticed that half, the means of the 40% jump in retail sales growth, actually most of it is in uh, restaurant spending. So um, most of the retail spending growth now all comes from the people in the US now spending all their money in drink, drink in drinking and eating, I mean, basically. That's, uh, not sure. <laughs> so for the Fed speak, what we're trying to say is some of the Fed officials, although they are not FOMC members, uh, uh, they started to say that maybe they actually wanted a 50 basis point hike. So in terms of our technical view, uh, we what we worry is that uh, manufacturing recession is underway right now. Uh, we see that in Taiwan exports, Korean exports, uh, also U.S. manufacturing, and of course in Singapore. So we think this so-called uh, disinflation team, whereby you know inflation is coming down, then uh, is losing a bit of ground, but we are we still believe in it because we we think there's a major slowdown coming uh, uh, around the world globally and, and that's also because we'll share with you later because there's a record inventories of retail in the in the US. So basically the US is overstocked with goods so that's why you're facing this uh, inventory decline. So uh, we favor REITs for you and slow and because of the slower growth but having said that there's still going to be at least two more rate hikes so uh, the timing of it might be a, a bit uh, maybe one or two months later because uh, we're still going to have to take on these two additional rate hikes or maybe even three. 
for the events ahead, uh, we are going to have a lot of corporates is getting Wilma. I think you can see this for your reference. And the webinars, we'll have two more uh, read webinars. So the big one will be the, the two banks, UOB, OCBC, and also the US core inflation number on the 24th. Uh, next slide. So uh, for our local domestic economy, it remains a very healthy uh, Singapore economy. So uh, there's still a lot of upside in uh, tourist arrivals. So although it's, it has jumped, I don't know, I think 50, from 57,000 to 900,000 in January, we, we still got another two, three months of this low low base effect because the reopening in Singapore only happened you know, technically on maybe in April and so forth. Uh, then in Singapore, you can see the table on right. This is wage growth as per the CPF data collected. That uh, wage growth is probably one of the highest uh, uh, in almost a decade. So that is also another strength of the local economy. Maybe not for business people, but anyway. <laughs> Next slide. So, so this is the one that worries us. So you can see the table on the left, the manufacturing uh, or contraction in exports for Singapore. So you can see that it's, it is probably it's like almost coming close to like the global financial crisis kind of contraction so it's extremely sharp so we just worry that there could be some manufacturing recession underway uh, one of the reasons that we might be seeing this is because uh, the table on the right is the amount of inventory that the u.s retail gets uh. so in a typical year you know in uh, among the retail shops uh, in the u.s you they normally increase their inventory by 20 billion you now 23 13.9 of course, it has to increase it because you know sales is higher, so of course you need more inventory. Uh, of course, twenty nineteen you can see is only up one, and that's why twenty nineteen was a bit sluggish uh, manufacturing. Then twenty twenty we got the COVID. Then of course they the there's a big jump twenty one, but twenty twenty two was the one that's worrying. So there's like a four times higher in jump in inventory. So we just worry that in the US retail there's just too much inventory. Uh, of course we know some of the reasons because the supply chain issues, so they might have over ordered. From you no know, just in case now to to now just too much already you know so uh, we worry this could trigger a, a sharp slowdown in manufacturing uh, we really saw that in in Vietnam so if you I mean if you go and Google anywhere you'll see that in November December there was news that a lot of factories in Vietnam had to shut down because there's basically no orders so we just worry that this is the one that's going to pull down the the US economy and, and also slow down that's why the rate hikes may not be as high as everyone expects it. Uh, Nick, next slide. Uh, okay, so so this is the CPI. I won't run through too much. I think we know. Uh, the other thing is, of course, the US retails. Uh, so on the left, what, what we're trying to show is that the services, the blue line is the one that's the problem. It continues to rise. Uh. The green line is goods. So you know, like hardware and so for goods is falling down. So that's the good thing. Uh, and surprisingly, I don't know why, but energy bounced back up. Uh, then the other thing is there's a, for retail sales, it was very strong in the US, 7%. You can see, although it's sliding down, but better than the 2019 pre-pandemic. But because most of the growth comes from, from food services and drinking places, and it's not on the good manufactured goods. And so that's why we still worry about manufacturing. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, this is just uh, to do a refresh because of all the... Because of the stronger than expected jobs data, stronger than expected... Uh, uh, sorry, CPI data uh, now the market how to read this is that uh, it, the market is expecting one 25 basis point hike in march initially if you look a few weeks ago there wasn't sure whether may will increase but now may also will be another hike uh, now the market thinks so there's a guaranteed at least two two rate hikes coming up then in june is a bit unknown so the market is undecided and then by december the market is still thinks there's going to be a rate cut and one of the reasons is because of the mindset of investors or because uh, the Federal Reserve always do U-turn. I mean, they might say they are bearish, bearish, then suddenly they can, I mean, they are hawkish, hawkish, then they can just U-turn and become a, a dovish. That means they want to cut rates. And so that's why the market doesn't always believe what the, the Fed's direction because they can just flip from any time. So that's why they still think, the market still thinks it's going to be a rate cut uh, by November or December. Okay, next slide. I think that should be it. I just want to uh, give a flash for everyone on what's the macro environment. Okay, uh, we can move on to Q&A. Yeah, I think I think the, the sort of questions in the queue. Uh, so we have, what is the intrinsic value of capital X, capital O and M? I think there are two questions here. Let's take the first one first. So for us, the 
the we, we can value in terms of the the capital group x o and m uh we look at the, the three other businesses the the book value of the business is about five dollars and twenty three cents uh but we we valued it uh based on uh with uh we, we put a, a premium on certain of their business, other businesses like asset management. So we, our, our overall target price is uh, for the business X, Apple O and M is about $6. Yeah. What is the intrinsic value of Apple O and M and San Marine merged entity? So the, the, the net asset value uh, of Apple O and M and San Marine is about 12 cents, uh, which is what, what, what is trading now. So at one times book, so you, you can see how the market is pricing the two entities merged together. At one time's book, uh, it's about 12 cents too. So that's, that seems like that's how they are pricing it now. Um, sorry, please repeat the valuation for Keppel and San Marine. The reception was breaking up. Yeah, that's, so that's on me. Uh, the, for, 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 Kep, for Keppel Corporation, what, what, what are they going to do? What they're going to realize is they're going to realize five, over $5 or $9.6 billion or $5 per share on the capital O and M group, so they, they, so they're going to realize that uh, as they divest O and M and Asset Co, along with the five hundred million dollars in cash that they will they will receive from the transaction, so our target price for for capital is nine fifty four when we include all of these uh, factors together. We don't have a valuation on Sam Com Marine, uh, but we think but if we were to provide a view, then we think that the a, a, a fair price for the new merch, Sam, Sam Corp Marine and Capo and them should be its book value, which is 12 cents too. BRC Asia, how much is order book outstanding? Uh, target price of $2.14 lowered from uh, price, thanks. Yeah, so the, the total order book outstanding is $1.4 billion and they expect to realize this probably within 15 months. Traditionally, they recognize this within a 12 months period, but because of this lag now, they now expect to recognize the, the, the 1.4 billion over time uh, within 15 months. Uh, our target price of $2.14 is reduced from $2.30. Um, next question. Keppel, would you buy Keppel for the Samcom Marine shares? Yeah, so you need to, you need to, our our house con is now we, we now have a buy recommendation on Semcorp on Capital Corp rather so sorry so we have a buy recommendation on Capital Corp and, and here's here's why firstly when they when they divest uh, asset co and Capital O and M they expected to receive about nine point six billion dollars from the divestment of uh both asset co and and uh Capital O and M so. How how do we distill down this nine point six billion? Nine point six billion dollars means it's about five dollars per share for the whole entire capital O and M, including the the asset co transaction, plus the five hundred million dollars that they're going to receive from Sam Corp Marine. So and just divesting this, they already have five five hundred dollars. Of of course, not all of this will be returned to shareholders, but they will return nineteen point one, uh, Sam Corp Marine shares for every one capital share that they hold. So. An illustrative example is for every 1,000 capital share that you hold, you will have 19,100 Samcorp Marine shares. Uh, so when we translate that to the share price, that means they are returning about $2 uh, plus to you. So if assuming you buy capital today, uh, I haven't looked at the share price, but if you buy capital at $7 today, assuming you buy $7 today, they return you $2 plus. That means that you already, you're only paying, essentially you're only paying $5 for the capital shares. Within, if Assuming you sell the, the same called marine shares, like, because they're paying you back right, $2 plus uh, for, the, for the same marine shares. But then I, I just also just realized that you have another, there's another part would, for the same marine shares, will you hold it? And we don't have a, a, a call. We think that there could be some near-term pressure on the same called marine shares. But what, one key thing we want to just highlight for this is, is essentially a reverse takeover. This whole KOM and Samcorp Marine deal is essentially a reverse takeover because you have the entire Samcorp Marine board, say for one director, stepping down, and then you have the KOM management team coming in to run the company. So we think that it's a fresh start. It's a new beginning for uh, the new Samcorp Marine group. 
uh, and and it, it, it could be be managed better. I think that's all from me. Yeah, I'll hand back to the rest of my team. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Terence. I'll, I'll take the one on the, uh, I think asking about DBS, uh, GP. Let me find that question. Uh, yeah, we asked, how much is the GP provision right back in uh, Sing dollars as well as the percentage of GP provisions? So, um, okay, I'll get the second part first. Uh, it, I can't really give a percentage of GP provisions as there were some right backs and then there were some normal GP uh, throughout the year. So I'll just give a breakdown of the figures. So the first, for fourth quarter, the, there was a right back of 116 million. Whereas for the third quarter, there was a GPs of 153 million. And the second quarter, there was right backs of 23 million. And in the first quarter, there was right backs of 112 million. So this total to a right back of 98 million for full year 22. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's all. I'll hand it over to the rest of my colleagues. I think there are a couple of questions uh, for me. Um, how will the increase of 1% to 2% by stamp duty mentioned in the budget 2023 affect REITs in Singapore properties going forward? Yeah, so this uh, increase in by stamp duty will affect REITs if they are looking to acquire Singapore property. So it, as, a, as, as though it's not challenging enough for REITs to acquire properties, this will make it even tougher for REITs to, to uh, make any accretive acquisitions, mainly because of the high cost of borrowing and the, the stable property valuation so, and, and cap rate. So yeah, it's, it's, it's will make, it'll make it tough for REITs to acquire properties, even, even tougher going forward. And uh, there's one on Prime. Uh, please comment on Prime US REIT and what price decline. Uh, yeah, so I'll leave the, the TA part to Zane. Uh, but for Prime US REIT, uh, as earlier mentioned, we, we think that right now is uh, a, lot, a lot of the negatives are already priced in. Right now, it's trading at 0 0.6 times price to NAV. So we think it's, it's worth it. And that they still have strong rental reversals to drive growth going forward. But what but we think the price decline could be mainly due to two factors. One of it is uh, the fact that one of their top 10 tenants is may not, or high chance they might not renew their, their lease at the end of the year. And another one is of course the, the macro conditions like the strong wage growth and the strong wage and the, the strong uh, uh, jobs growth and the CPI numbers. It will probably uh, bring the, the US, like, like the Fed might hike even more, like Paul mentioned earlier. So this, of course, uh, made all the all the reads kind of not say crash uh, but kind of U turn because they were going uh, recovering from the since the start of the year. But then uh, this uh sudden uh good good uh set of macro data might make the Fed one uh raise rates even further. So that definitely affected all the reads as well. And Prime was no exception. Yeah. So I'll hand over the time to the rest of my team. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, let me just run through some of them before uh, handing it over to Zane. Uh, Pombi might have to run off because I have another meeting. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there's a Sabana read uh, later on. Darren, when you have time, can you just... Oh. Okay, uh, let me just answer this. Hi, Paul. I read somewhere Penang manufacturing is booming. Could the slowdown in Vietnam manufacturing be because shift to Penang? Uh, no, uh, I think the, actually the slowdown in, in Vietnam... Uh, it's not like uh, yeah, it's not like I'm an expert that knew about it. Just that when I was in the Sabeco briefing, uh they they did mention that uh, uh it might even impact their business. Sabeco is a beer. So even a beer company said the slowdown in the manufacturing might affect them. So it's mainly a lot of it is on shoes and uh, uh shoes and textile. So uh, that's from the media. Uh, that's a, as best a source of information as I can get because I don't really look at uh, know any many Vietnam companies. Uh, I don't think it's affecting Penang because Penang is more semiconductor. Um, Penang and even uh, Singapore is is benefiting because there's a big shift for semiconductor equipment. Uh, because anyone who's building semiconductor equipment, I'm not sure if you want to build anything in China right now because of all the the restrictions. So Singapore and Viet and and uh, and Malaysia is benefiting from this big wave of uh, semiconductor equipment manufacturing. Uh, uh, broadening their supply chain 
uh, and also the feedback we got why they like uh, not saying they like uh, there's a preference for Malaysia is number one because of the language uh, and because there's a close proximity to Singapore actually so uh, because of the close proximity you know those who are based here well, most of them are based here anyway so they might want the easier for them to kind of you know, project manage so these are some of the reasons uh, favorable reasons why uh, Malaysia stands out uh, uh, and of course Singapore for uh, very high-end manufacturing uh, yeah Okay, I think it's a very long answer. I know you didn't ask so much stuff about it. Uh, Genting call not in points. Sorry. Is this open to... Oh, yeah. Sorry, did this... Uh, uh, Genting one is not a webinar. Just uh, sorry for the confusion. What, what we're trying to show in the weekly is... Uh, if someone can flash it, it's just to show you that that uh, these are the results coming out. Yeah, it's not a, a, a web, webinar. Yeah, so, so, sorry for the uh, confusion. That, uh, it's just to show you that... that uh, uh, these are some of the events. So, so just to show you that uh, re Genting results is coming up. We are not even in the call ourselves because they said it's only open to those who cover the stock. Uh, but if you're not in the call, I'm not sure how you're going to cover. But uh, anyway, uh, but, but of course, we can we can still speak to them. But uh, you know, Genting doesn't really release much information uh, and they hardly want to talk to anyone anyway. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, Pi Paul, the net net, net link depth H to 2020. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. It's 2026. Yeah, my, my, my mistake. Yeah, sometimes I, yeah, it's 2026. So, the, the probably the biggest asset apart from the fiber that net link has is the depth because they, I think they H 600 million, if I'm not mistaken, at 1%. They fix it at 1% to 2026. So, actually, that's technically, their, technically their asset too because they hedge it. So, but yeah, that's why, uh, uh, but even. With that hedge, you can still see the impact of the higher interest rates because their interest is just so low. So, uh, because this is just the first quarter where you see this big jump in interest, you're going to see it in subsequent quarters. Yeah, but but thanks for the correction. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, my favorite one. Can we have an Outlook update for Comfort Delgro? Okay. Okay, let me just run through again uh, for Comfort Delgro. Uh, so for Comfort Delgro, why we liked it is because it was a, to us, it was a recovery story. So there's a you no know, improvement in earnings, and there was also a balance sheet story. So for the recovery earnings, we all know a reopening. Uh, but what happened was the rebound didn't wasn't as strong as expected because they had uh, cost issues in uh, in the UK, and of course they had COVID rebates. Uh, they have to because of COVID still in China. In China, uh, they still have to compensate and give uh, rebates. Uh, excuse me to the drivers. Uh, uh, but the UK thing you you takes a bit of time to to recover because they need to every year only they can reprice it up. Singapore recovery was intact. Uh, Singapore earnings probably I think jumped three four times. Uh, yeah. So this one will be intact. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, the the balance sheet story was because uh, uh sorry if uh, probably ninety percent you heard of this same old thing that I'm saying again, but they exited the. COVID with a stronger balance sheet. So they exited COVID with 700 million net cash. And why the cash will continue to pile up is because uh, their depreciation is about 400 million. Uh, but their CAPEX is probably, probably mid 200. So they will technically get additional 100 million plus the profit. So they should be getting like two, 300 million operating cash flow a year. So that was the whole thing. But of course, no, nobody cares. Everybody just look at the taxi is a bad business. So, so that's the second part. The, the concern in the near term is uh, there was some worry that maybe Air Asia might be setting up a right hailing here. For us, we're not that worried because it's so hard to get drivers. And also, uh, number two, uh, Air Asia started, also wanted to do food delivery. And I'm not sure what happened to that. It just quietly disappeared. Uh, the, the other third thing is there's some possibility there's some uh, aggressive bidding for the bus uh, so there's some news that they there's the phasing competition for two of their bus but uh, again uh, you only know that probably I think third quarter of this year if I'm not mistaken I'm not from what the press media so this these are the things so for the near term when the results come out they uh, we hope and they better, <laughs> they better do some uh, with their strong balance sheet pay a uh, a uh, uh, a special dividend or so because otherwise it's probably going to upset a lot of shareholders or even analysts because they are hoarding too much cash already. they should need to pay out some so these are the things that we are looking out for in the upcoming re uh, uh, results yeah okay yeah thanks I'm probably going to have the same question again uh, next week because the share price is so more okay uh, if there are no more other questions I think uh, uh, we just let uh, 
Uh, Darren, work on the yeah. Sabana. Then I think we can we can we can move on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a question on. Can I ask about the Sabana read issue? Is something going on? Uh, so for the Sabana read, right? There's an offer from Vola Group, which currently owns a uh, five point four percent of the issued shares, to acquire an additional ten percent of Sabana units at zero point four six five cents. So this is not a general offer; it's just a partial offer of additional ten percent of the shares that is in circulation. So this offer is is priced at uh, zero point eight eight price to book and at a 6.6% .6 dividend yield. Uh, but then if we compare this offer to one offer that ESR, uh, uh, ESR re offered to merge with Sabana back in 2020, right? that was priced at 0 0.377 cents per unit of Sabana read, and that was at a 0 0.74 times price book. So uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, I don't say people, uh, investors, and uh, some of the Activist investors uh, forgot the name. One one of it. They said that was a low ball offer back then in twenty twenty, which which was why it eventually got voted down. So now this uh this offer to acquire ten percent at zero point four six five is uh, at a premium of nine point four percent to the announcement date view up as well. So personally, I think uh, it is it is a good deal to just perhaps uh, uh, sell back your ten percent of your shares to. To them at a premium anyway right now sabana is trading at 42 cents so it's it's like getting an instant upside to, uh, versus maybe if you hold the shares for one year you can get maybe 50 percent so it's like the what the bird in hand is worth two in a bush that kind of theory yeah so i'll i'll uh i i, I would uh so call take take up the offer of the 10 percent yeah so, yeah, so that's my view. Okay, so I think uh, that's all for me. I'll hand the time to Zane. Yeah, okay. Let me just answer this few, then, then uh, we can yeah. just go back uh, to Zane. Okay, so the manufacturing shift should be good for venture. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, the shift from China, uh, it was probably got a bit held back in in uh, during the pandemic so just to give you an example i mean this is a real life example like valuetronics uh, all their plants was in china then in but one thing global management they're very flexible they immediately set up a, a plant in vietnam which is as big as the ones in, in china because they say got no choice they never step uh, the pinky also they didn't leave china but because of the tariff war they already started uh, so what has happened is that manufacturing capacity in China, by the local Chinese manufacturers, those are like ample. We probably got like over the oversupply of totally oversupplied because a lot of the domestic Chinese couldn't come out of China to set up factories here. Uh, partly also because COVID, uh, so they couldn't come out. So you could get another wave coming out. Uh, we saw some of it in 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 Malaysia, like Nine Dragons have like I don't know how many plants set up in Malaysia for carbon uh, corrugated carbon. But there could be another wave coming out from China by the Chinese manufacturers to, to at least uh, set up some facility outside of China and not just be confined there. So, so uh, it's good for venture because venture, uh, you know, the, they will get new customers. The, the problem now, I think, if you are, if you listen in to all this electronics, is probably they're not sure of capacity, actually, some of the, uh, for some of the electronic companies. Uh, what's your target price for Singapore for next quarter? Uh, okay, we don't do quarterly, but I think if you want technicals, because we don't cover Genting Singapore, uh, I, will, I will leave leave it to... to but, uh, uh, but what we're trying to say also, just one last point is that if you want to, to buy into the China... Uh, sorry, you want to buy into the Singapore recovery in gaming, uh, we think maybe the Macau ones... I don't know, we don't cover China, we don't cover Macau, but if you want to, to get something in Singapore and also the whole... Re probably like a massive rebound in China... I mean, uh, from in Macau, then like Las Vegas sense. I mean, you, you get the best of both worlds. So you get a bit of Singapore and you get a bit of China. And of course, there's also re, uh, Las Vegas right? because there's going to be a super, know, the biggest pent up demand you're ever going to see in Macau since they never get to gamble for two years. Oh, sorry, almost three years never get to gamble. So uh, you can, can imagine the rebound that's going to happen in Macau. So so for us, if you want to play that team, you know, uh, uh, again, it's not a recommendation, but... Uh, the big jump might be felt more in, in Macau rather than in Singapore. Yeah. Okay, uh, so thanks everyone. I think we're going to hand it over to Zane for the for all the, the technicals. Yeah, thanks for your patience. Yeah. Uh, Zane, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Uh, let me just share my screen now. All right. Okay, so let me begin. Uh, the first one is the 
Hansing Index. So let's take a look. So uh, Hansing Index, I think currently uh, we are currently in a downtrend channel over here in this part. So uh, we're still pulling back. Currently, we are finding some uh, support around the 20.7k level, this horizontal level over here, which was a previous uh, a resistance and a support last time over here. So I think we might find some support over here. Uh, the next support level, if we break, then it's around 20.2k uh, over here, which was another previous strong resistance level over here. As for the immediate resistance wise, I think it should be around here near the 21,100 to 21,300 area. So this was the level that we broke uh, last week and there was a retest and we found resistance. And this, also, this level also coincides with this uh, downtrend resistance uh, uh, over here as well. So there's two resistance levels to take note. And this one is a Capital Land China Trust. So I think we are pulling back. So uh, we're still following this uptrend channel over here. But uh, we could be near nearing a support level near the $1.12 level. So this is uh, this could be a retest of this uh, inverted head and shoulders uh, bullish breakout, as well as a retest of this uh, uptrend channel over here. Okay, moving on to Maple Tree Pan Asia, I think um, we actually broke down the neckline of uh, 175, 176, which is the neckline of this uh, inverted head and shoulders breakout. Uh, but we found, looks like we are finding some support at this uh, trend line over here as well. So that's around 169, 170. I think that should be some support over here. Uh, but if you do break the next support, you think it will be around 166, which is this uh, previous strong horizontal support uh, level over here. For the resistance wise, for now the strong resistance will be at 175, 176 level. And uh, moving on to escort. Okay, escort, uh, the buy call on it today. So I think uh, at this region, we are finding some support at the uptrend channel support, as well as we retested this uh, resistance at 103 and uh, over here, this resistance area broke off and there was a retest over here. So it looks like we're finding some support over here. We could be setting up for a bounce. Now, for now, the immediate resistance wise around the 107 to 108 area over here. Uh, for support wise, it's around the 103 level over here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, DC, moving on to the other reads. Okay, oh, DC is still in the pulling back. Uh, after hitting the uptrend channel resistance around the 207, 208 mark over here. So last week, looks like we're currently finding some support at 198 level, which is a short-term uh, previous swing high that turned into a short-term support over here. I think we could be trading sideways for now. Uh, if we are continuing to find support over here, then uh, the current resistance likely to be around the 207, Two dollar and five cents to about two dollar and seven two dollar eight cents level. Uh, the next support to take note if one nine eight doesn't hold, it'll be around uh one ninety three for capital DC. The next one is the ascenders. Okay, ascenders. Um, looks like we retested two two supports. The first one is the trend line. This support over here as well as the previous uh, resistance level over here we break out. So it looks like a, a nice test over here at around the 273, 275 level. Currently, we are doing a little bit of bounce. For now, the immediate resistance, I think, will likely be around um, this 284 level, around, yeah, which is this swing high over here and over here as well. We see some resistance back then. Uh, then for support-wise, it will be, this uh, 275, uh, these lows over here. Yeah. So looks like the, some of the reads are doing a bit of a, a bounce after following a retest. Okay, next one is UOL. So I think UOL, uh, I'm currently uh, bearish on it. Looks like we are, uh, we broke down of this rising wedge pattern at $6.85. And then another thing to note is that we actually broke below this a strong uh, resistance breakout last night around the 680 mark. So uh, currently, it's either we might find some uh, sideways 
trading or to retest uh, 680 to about 690, this resistance over here. Yep. Then short-term support-wise, I think we'll be looking at the swing lows over here. That's around the 657 mark over here. Then Singtel. Singtel, I think, uh, currently doesn't look uh that good for now. Okay, uh, we actually look could be break down of this uh trend line support over here, uh, but we have found some support from this uh swing low over here. So from here, I think could be some sideways over here with the support around the two forty three, but resistance could be around two forty seven, um. I hit to about 250 this zone over here. Yep. Then another resistance resistance up top will be the recent swing high bounce around 253 to 257. Okay. Uh if Singtel, if we do break down 243, I think next level to take note will be this swing lows over here back in October of last year. That's around the 232 to the 235 region. Okay, Wilma is next. Okay, Wilma, I think uh, currently we are doing some sideways after the breakdown of this huge range over here. So now the $4 level is still a strong resistance over here because it was a previous range support. Uh, then for now, I think some support could come in from this swing low at around 390, 389. Then the next level of support will be around 385. We go for lower than that. Uh, that will be the 50% retracement mark uh, for Wilma. So I expect some uh, further short-term uh, range trading over here. Okay, Apple, Apple, after the slide, after the earnings, we found some support near the $7 mark over here. Then we did a bounce. But currently it looks like we are doing a retest of this black color line. So this was a trend uh, support line and broken it. We are doing a retest over here. So currently resistance is this. Today's open around the 734 region over here. So over here to this is one resistance level. The next resistance level, if you do break through, will be this blue color uh, uptrend support line that was being broken last time. So that will be probably this seven near the $7.50 region over here. Uh, then short term support wise will be this near the swing lows over here around the $7 to $7.05 level. So for now, it looks like we are currently rejected off this previous uh, support. We could see some pullback to maybe uh, do a range or try to uh, attempt the resistance for, for these two levels again. Okay, next one is uh, Sam Marine. Okay, Sam Marine, I think uh, we are looking at a uh, head and shoulders breakdown. So. Over here, there's a head and shoulders pattern being formed with the neckline at uh, 13 cents. We actually broke down of it today with the high volume. So uh, I think for now, if you look at the, to find the support, the first support level could be around the 12 cents uh, mark. So this is the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement level. When we take the swing low at uh, 101 and swing high at 151. Uh, then this 120, 121 level also coincides with uh, a previous strong resistance level over here. So this could be a short-term retest. Then uh, going down lower, the next support could be around the 117 mark over here, which is this uh, downtrend, uh, downtrend channel support. Okay, for resistance-wise, I think short-term-wise, we could be looking around 1 to 12.5 cents. Then the high region will be around uh, 13 cents, which is this breakdown level over here. Five seven nine. Okay, Ting Ting Clean Energy. Okay, I think for this, uh, we are still trending nicely up in an uptrend over here. We actually following a double bottom formation. Okay, then uh, looks like doing some form of sideways pattern over here. So for now, short term resistance around the two dollar seventeen level, which is near the swing high of this high over here in April last year. So over here, I think 270 to about 222 could be some resistance. Okay, then uh, short-term support, you can see over here, it will be this swing low around the $2 level. 
then following uh then if you go lower than that could be around the 195 level that will match with this uh uptrend channel support over here for for this stock Mine eight six yeah. Xping. Okay, Xping. I think uh, currently we could be forming a descending, could be a descending triangle. So it looks like a uh, consolidation for now with the support around the thirty five dollar thirty cents level, which is a breakout of this resistance level over here. So we just did a retest of this spot last week. So currently we are like doing a bit of a bounce. Then resistance wise could be around the near the $42 level over here. So that this will match with a, a swing high to take near the there's a swing high over here near 4150 over here as well. So on here this would this will be the resistance over here for XPing. Okay, any thoughts on TSM? Okay. Uh, TSM, I think currently we are sideways trading. So there's a, there's a support around the $90.60 $90 level, then the resistance around the $98 level. Uh, currently, we are hanging near the support levels. Uh, but if we do a further pullback wise, I think we could actually read we touch this uh, uptrend support line again, that will bring us to maybe about, uh, to a support of maybe of $87 or $88 around there. Yep. Then for a short term, if that is broken, the short term resistance will be this $90.60 level that was being broken uh, for TSM. So for now, I think just uh, some short term consolidation and pullback after the strong rally over that took place over here at the start of this year. Tesla. Okay, Tesla, I think we are trading in an trend channel, this blue color uh, channel. So for now, short term resistance wise will be around the $2, uh, sorry, uh, $214 level. This where we saw some selling over here. And then support wise will be this swing lows around there's a support at around the $1, sorry, $190 uh, swing low over here. And if we pull back again, that will actually match with this uh, channel support as well. Okay, then further resistance up, we could be looking around the $224 level. Uh, that will be a retest of this um, red color trend line over here. So this red color trend line is also a um, neckline of a, of a head and shoulders breakdown, if you look at it. So there's a head and shoulders place. So this is the neckline we could, the retest could find a resistance over here. And then further resistance up will be around the $233 level, which is a swing high over here in November last year and the 61.8% retracement level, where it a high around the 315 level and the low was at $101. And so that's my view on Tesla. The next one is Meta. Okay, Meta, I think we are, after the strong gap up, we are currently just pulling back in a bullish, possible bullish flag. So for now, we could find some support, uh, maybe at around the $167 level. That's based on the, the, the wedge support over here. Um, over here, the one, $172 level is also previous resistance over here. That requires some uh, support level also. For short term resistance wise, I think it could be a retest of this swing highs of last week. So that will be uh, the match with the wedge resistance over here as well as a swing high. That's around around possibly $179 to $181 for Meta. Okay, the next one is uh, in phase energy. Okay, I think at in phase currently we are after we broke out of this downtrend resistance line, we are just sideways trading for now. So we found resistance at the two forty seven two hundred forty seven dollars, which was the previous um swing low support over here in October last year. Uh, 
Uh, as for support wise, currently there's quite a strong support around two, near the two hundred dollar level over here. So I think that will be a temporary support. Okay. Um, but if we this support actually breaks, right? The next, the next key level probably be around uh near the near these swing lows around the one dollar one hundred eighty dollars level. So this will this will be the swing lows over here for M phase. This one is more than now. Okay, Moderna, okay, um, currently could be finding some support following a retest of this swing low around $162. So over here, to find some support, short-term resistance-wise could be the swing high generated over here around $176. Then following up is around near $180 for Moderna. Yeah. Uh, okay, some Hong Kong stocks. Okay, the Hang Index Management Tech Index. So I think we are continue to pull back after we drop out of this uh, uptrend channel. So I think we are similar to Hang Seng. We could be following a downtrend uh, channel over here for now. So we're just pulling back for now. The short term support wise. Could be the next support level to look maybe is near the four dollars mark. There's a psychological level. Uh, as well as this will be uh, this range support last time that took place in the month of December of last year. So that I think that will, could be a good support for this uh for this here. For current sub resistance wise, I think will be this four dollars forty cents level over here. This support that we broke down then became a resistance upon the retest over here. Uh yeah. So that's for this stock. Okay, then for Tencent, I think uh, we uh, we broke down this uptrend support line. Currently, it looks like just a uh, range trading in place. So, here we have this range over here. The support looks like uh, $368 we test this today. Uh, for resistance wise, mm, there could be resistance at around 382, 383, and followed by the swing high around near $395. Yeah, so, it looks like just uh, some consolidation in place. And okay, then 2318 is a Ping An insurance. Ping An insurance, a bit similar to Tencent. Uh, we are also break down this uptrend support line. Uh, currently looks like just consolidation for now also. So the support is around the $56 level. Resistance wise could be the first level of resistance around the 59, then followed by 60 near $60 to $61 over here. Next one is uh, okay, JD. Okay, JD, I think, um, looks like we actually, looks like it's pretty weak uh, since that we actually broke down this short the swing low at 213 and then uh, over here and there's a retest and looks like there's some further pullback again. So for short term resistance will be this 13 level and then followed by uh, 224 over here, this swing high over here. Uh, support wise will be the swing low generated over here is around near $200. Then I think uh, again okay, the Fibonacci level wise, yeah, 199200 is the 50% retracement. Then the next level could be around 185, which is a 61.8% retracement, uh, which is coincide with this swing over here in end of November. Yeah. So that's my take on JD. And here is the local banks. Uh, UOB, I think currently we are trading an uptrend channel following this downtrend resistance, short, short term downtrend resistance breakout. Um, it could be resistance near the $31 level over here. Then following up will be this uh, previously tested near the 31, 30 to 31, 40 level. Short term support wise, if you do a pull back down to the channel support, probably maybe uh, at $30, 40 cents, I guess. Yeah. But still uh, trending up nicely. Okay, next one is uh, OCBC. 
the OCBC uh, following a back test of this trend line resistance over here, we found some support uh, and also this following this uh, previous resistance over here and uh, support over here. So this $12.80 mark is quite a good support over here for now. Then we rebounded. For now, it looks like whether we can see whether we can climb back to get in the channel again. The, so for now, short-term resistance could be around the $13.20 level, which is the swing highs over here. Yeah. Then if you look at the channel support, channel resistance, I think maybe at around $13.40 over here. Yeah. So this one also still trending nicely. And this is a look at the last one, uh, DBS. So DBS, uh, after the results, we 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 actually we were at the resistance area around the thirty six dollar to thirty six dollar thirty cents level. We pull uh pull back to re to retest this um channel support over here. Looks like we find some found some good support over here again near the thirty five dollar mark. So let's see whether this over here can hold. And then for resistance wise, will be this this uh, thirty six to thirty six thirty levels again. Uh, if we actually break down on this channel, then I think the next support level could be this swing around the $34.20 mark over here. Yeah. ETG Therapeutics. I think uh, this one is a short term uptrend over here. You can see. So we have this uptrend support line that's holding it. So for now, it looks like uh, maybe just sideways over here for now. Short term support around $16.90. Then the uh, resistance will be the swing high near the $19.60 level. Uh, last time, previously over here, there's also a uh, swing high in January last year, around the $20.30 level, to take note. Yep. So oh, this is the this is my take on this uh, TG Therapeutics. Then for Merck, okay, let's look at Merck. Okay, Merck, I think we are still, from the long term perspective, I still quite bullish since we actually broke above this resistance uh, over here. Then we went up to about the high of one near 115, then we did a back test that so was supported around $99 over here. So for, for now, looks like I think just uh, possibly sideways trading. Since over here, short term, we actually broke out of this downtrend channel over here and then uh, just moving in the range for now. With the immediate resistance around the 110 level, uh, then the next resistance to think of yeah, around 11, then followed by the swing high at 115. Then for support wise, it will be this uh, around at 105. Then next support level around 102. Then if we do back test this resistance again, previous resistance, that will be around the $100 psychological level. So that's for, uh, for Merck. Okay, T on UMS. Okay, UMS, I think we had a pullback over here. We reached the 50% retracement level at $1.10. We found some support. Currently, we are retesting the previous support now turn resistance at $1.16 over here. So let's see whether it's able to re recover back above. Then the next resistance level will likely be around, uh, for now, it'll be around $1.19 to $1.20. Then uh further support down further support for now will be around one dollar ten cents. Uh that will be a retest of this swing low. Uh if you move down further, then around one dollar and four cents, which is the 61.8% retracement level for UMS. Yang Zhang shipping. For Yang Zhang shipping, I think currently 
we broke down all these uh, rising wedge pattern, but we found some support at the downtrend channel support over here the, at one dollar and twenty two cents. Okay, then uh, currently we are doing a rebound to near the channel resistance again. So that's around the one dollar thirty cents level over here. Okay, then further up will be one dollar thirty three cents the swing highs over here for the next resistance level. Uh, short term support wise, I think will be around one dollar twenty six, one dollar twenty seven. So this will be a horizontal line over here that we got off. Yeah. Okay, hyphens pharma. Okay, hyphens pharma. I think look not bad since that uh this key uh, near the thirty six cents level. Over here was a previous support last time. Then over here we see that it became a resistance. We had tested three times in the past. Recently, a few times and we actually broke out of it. Uh, so that's actually not bad. So following that, the next resistance could be around the 30. Looking at the past charts, could be around the 38 cents, 37 half cents level, then followed by a uh, swing high over here. That's around the 41 cents level. Yeah. So this is on hyphens. Okay, then menu live USB. Okay. Okay, menu live. Looks like we retested the previous support around the 31 cents level. We found rejection over here. And then we pulled back currently just like sideways for now, I guess. So support wise will be this swing around 27 cents. And the resistance wise, I think moving up would be around between 20, uh, 30 cents to about 31 cents this area over here. Yeah, that's for menu life. Okay, Hopper. Hopper, we retested a swing high at around the $11.20 level back in August and September last year. We found some resistance. So we're currently pulling back. Uh, for now, short term, there's support wise, I think a good one will be around the $10.50 level. So this will be the swing highs over here in June to July last year. And then we have swing low back over here in. Uh, February, yeah. So we do a retest here, probably we'll find some support over here. Yes. Overall here, we also see an uptrend uh, over here as well. Okay, Hong Kong land. I think for now, a bit bearish given that we are pulling back. We actually broke a below, broke down this uh, uptrend channel also. Next support we could be looking at possibly is this um trend uptrend channel support that could be around uh, maybe four dollars sixty cents. Then another level to take note, horizontal level wise, I think around near the four dollar fifty three cents level over here as well. And that would be some swing lows over here in December or so. Yeah. Okay, then for dairy farm. Dairy farm are um, a bit bearish for now since that uh, it actually looks like it broke down of a rising wedge pattern at near the $3.30 level. So I'm expecting some sort of consolidation of full, full bank. So the first level of support really swing lows around here, around the $3.18, $3.19 level. And if we do a deeper pullback, I think we could retest this um next swing low at around $3.03 uh, $3 level over here. That will be a retest this uh, strong resistance last time as well that could possibly provide a good support for DFI. And let me just go through some last ones before we end the webinar for today. So for Franken, I think um, we retested the $1.19, $1.20 resistance level on uh, Thursday last week. 
Then currently it looks like we're just trading in small candles, just resting, I guess. So for now, the resistance still remains 119 to about 123, this swing high over here. For support wise, I think if we do a pullback, this one dollars and 11 cents level will be a good support, given that it's supported the stock quite well over here. Looks like just for the possibly for the sideways movement for now. Okay, I'll just do uh three more on the some of the tech, tech names. Okay, the for EM, I think uh we actually broke down this uh, short term ascending triangle around 342. Then we retested the swing low over here around 327. So currently it looks like doing a small bounce. Uh, short term resistance will be this 342 uh, horizontal level that broke down off. Yeah. And support is at this level 327 over here. Okay, then I read. I read, I think we are pulling back to retest this downtrend channel we broke out of. So around here, if 55 cents level, we could find some support. Uh, but if you go down further, I think we could maybe retest 553 and a half cents, which is this uh, resistance line that we broke out of over here. And then we also have an uptrend support line over here to take note as well. The okay, last one I'll take on is uh, this uh, HS tag. So for HS tag, I think similar to uh, one of the HSI tag management ETF I explained earlier, uh, uh, it looks like we broke down of this rising wedge pattern currently pulling back in the downtrend channel. So for now, resistance wise, I think could be around the 73 and a half cents level over here, which is this uh, support level that we broke down, then we can resistance over here. Uh, that would mean the downtrend channel resistance as well. Mm, then support wise, I think for now, possibly around the 70 cents mark. Uh, if you do a deeper pullback, we could maybe retest 67 cents region over here. That would be the range uh, support over here for HST. Uh, so that's all for me today. Uh, apologies, we couldn't take all the questions due to time constraints. Yeah, so I think, uh, that's all from our team today. Uh, thanks for attending our uh, morning call. See you again uh, next week. Bye, everyone.